Hello, welcome to the Mostly Yoga Podcast. My name is Aaron, and this is my show. First time listeners, if you're new here, hello, welcome. And to long time listeners, hello, and welcome back. If you're wondering how you can support this podcast, there's a donation link in the show notes below where you can go to this website, coffee.com slash mostly yoga to buy me a coffee. Uh, coffee spelled ko-fi.com slash mostly yoga. Any amount is greatly appreciated and the money will go towards subscription costs, new equipment, should I choose to upgrade, when I choose to upgrade, and just, you know, pocket money for me for doing this thing. Funding my breakfast at Yakun. All the good stuff. If you, uh, any amount is appreciated, like I said, thank you if you donate, thank you if you don't, doesn't matter. Still free to listen to. Today's episode is sponsored by BC Flow State. Rediscover the way you move, feel, and perform through the use of natural and authentic movements that can help you build strength, regain your mobility, and reconnect yourself with your physical body. Room, room. It's always super noisy when I record at this time. Uh, anyway. Uh, yes, you, uh, Bronson has produced a bunch of new content on mobility and movement on his Instagram, which you can go and check out. It's at bc underscore f-l-o-w-s-t-a-t-e, flow state. Uh, so be sure to do that. And if you're a fan of all things spicy, then spice up your life with this unique homemade cilantro chili by my friend, Steph, Red Dot, I mean, <laughs> it's by Red Dot Chili Peppers, which is by my friend, Steph. Um, for the love of all things spicy and green and good, order yourself a bottle or two or three on her Instagram or Facebook page at Red Dot Chili Peppers. All the links will be in the description below. <clears throat> My guest today is Amber Sawyer, and she's one of the teachers at home who conducts weekly pre- and postnatal yoga classes there, and who has a lot of experience and knowledge relating to women's health, particularly in pregnancies and postpartum. Uh, she focuses primarily on empowering women during their birthing experience, Navigating the path of pregnancy and what it takes to prepare for motherhood. Ooh, scary stuff, I'm sure, as a woman. It's a new stage in your life. Uh, she shares a lot on, on this podcast, along with other female related, uh, stuff. A lot of, a lot of this shit is like, I've never, I've never heard before. Um, but, yeah, it's still very interesting. This this podcast was honestly really informative, like for me as as a man, even as a man, you know. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of moments during our conversation where I was just like, uh, like okay, because I mean, like she was just sharing about like periods and vaginas, and I was just. Uh, I, I mean, I, I prepared as much as I could. <laughs> I, pre- I prepared as much as I could for our chat. And then she tells me about like menstruation and menopause and, and, and how women experience all that. And I'm like, uh, I'm like, okay. I mean, I, I, I just, I got to take your word for it. I don't know. I don't really have any follow up questions from there. So fun times. Uh, so uh, yeah. So here we go. Uh, without further ado. Here is Amber. Here is, here is Amber. Enjoy. Hello, Amber. Hello. <laughs> Today's today is going to be a special, to me at least, it's a very special episode because we're going to be talking about a lot of things that I don't have a lot of knowledge in, and which is your specialty. So, I was doing a lot of research before I came here. Research about the topic. Research about you as well and your. You're, you have a very impressive resume <laughs> from what I, I saw online. And I wanted to do as much research, research as I can about this topic because it was something that I wanted to ask you, someone who knows a lot about it, as much as I can within this time frame. And I've even asked the help of Malvina to give me a few questions to ask. So I have a, li- a nice list of it to ask and I'll throw in once in a while when I don't know what to ask anymore. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Do you, uh, you want to say anything? I want to say thank you for having me here and to have this conversation with you. I'm really looking forward to it. And um, yeah, I'm excited to share and to just dive into all these fun topics. Mm -hmm. And I, ha I did think about you when I heard you were researching a bit before we were going to meet. And I thought, oh, <laughs> he's probably researching all kinds of things he never even prenatal, thought to look post at. Prenatal, <laughs> postpartum. I had to Google what a doula was. <laughs> I thought, I mean, I know what a doula is, but I didn't know what it was. I just know that it was some home birth thing. But it's it's a completely, there's the midwife, there's the, the doula, right? Mm -hmm. The doula is the more, the more of the emotional, emotional support. support. Yeah, the emotional yeah. support, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know that until today, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, okay. So we'll start off with an easy question. How did yoga come to you or how did how did you find yoga or how did yoga come to you yeah. the origin story oh i love the story um i always say that yoga meets us exactly where we are in that moment and and so i can say i started to have a relationship with yoga in 1999 and it was when I came across, um, I believe it was Rodney Yee, a Rodney Yee DVD at that time. And I was in university. And when I experienced just the, a class from my own video player um, going alongside with him, suddenly I, a whole world opened because it reminded me a lot of my childhood when I was in gymnastics for quite a, a number of years, about 14 years I was practicing. and. And then yet at the same time, it took it to what seemed to be a deeper level. I could feel and sense that this is beyond gymnastics. There's something else here. And I've always had a really um, big interest in spirituality, even from quite small. And so there was something there that I realized, oh, this is larger than gymnastics. And I put it aside. And then um, around a year later, around 2000, I was... I had just finished university. I was in graduate school. How old were you? Um, at this time, I must have been 20, around. Wow. How old? No, almost 20, yeah, 21 or so. Mm. And I was in graduate school. And, uh, you know, my, my bachelor's is in math and chemistry, which was pretty stressful, double majoring. And then I went to graduate school for biomedical engineering, which is also really stressful. And the way I was dealing with that stress was competitive cycling, <laughs> Whoa, okay. road cycling. So I actually had a lot of stress in my life and my, my exercise choice was not helping to balance my stress. It was just adding to it. And so then a girlfriend asked me, do you want to come try a yoga class? It's really hot, and it's called Bikram. Ah, everybody starts out with Bikram, yeah. <laughs> and it was in the basement of the YMCA, mm -hmm. and that was in the year 2000. And so it was really cold where I was staying. I was in Alabama in the U.S. It was winter time, And I right away loved the heat of it. And then again, I fell in love with, oh, what is this practice? It's amazing. And so that was the doorway. I started with Bikram Yoga, and... And when I went to that class with my friend, from then there was no turning back. I started going regularly and I followed the teacher to a new studio that he opened and it became a really staple part of my life. And, and then it was a, a huge doorway from there. And probably like every person's relationship with yoga, it's, it's been an ongoing living relationship. So it's evolved and it's had its ups and downs and gone sideways and twist and turn. and shape-shifted many times but i've never let go of the hand of yoga since then <laughs> and how, and how, from then until now your practice has evolved into many different ways from the physical practice from say big bikram yeah. to maybe vinyasa or whatever and then it came to, to where you are now which is in the in the 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 birthing side of it. Yes. How, how was that transition like? Oh, this is my life story. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, it goes back to what I was just saying before as well, is that I'm always relating to yoga mm. because it's a mirror is, is how I'm relating to myself. Mm. And so the reflection has changed throughout my life through whatever I'm encountering and what's happening in my life in that moment. So... 
probably similar to others. As I started, it was a really physical practice, and that was exactly what I needed at that time because I was trying to relieve stress from the rigors of graduate school, and also I'd had two ACL injuries and surgeries from, on so both exactly. knees. No, that was from football. <laughs> so I was really active in many different sports, and I think that was also leftover gymnastics injuries. and. And so I was trying to recover, and and I was having chronic low back pain at that time too, which again I think is left over from gymnastics. And so yoga addressed a lot of my physical needs, and and then started to address my mental needs as well. And and the door started to open. I started reading more books. I was at the same time studying Ayurveda, and so that was complementing everything I was doing. And and. Thread by thread, my life started to unravel and to weave itself back together in a different kind of tapestry. And and I stayed with this practice um, for years. And then I moved to Singapore in 2006. And that's when I would say there was another evolution of my practice because suddenly I was in the East. And in the East? Oh, I was in Asia. It, yeah, in, in Asia <laughs> compared to being in the West uh-huh. in the U.S. And I was exposed to a whole nother level of yoga. Um, I started meeting different spiritual masters from various lineages and reading a lot of different books. This is when Autobiography of a Yogi came into my Ooh, life. Oh, I read that, yeah. Yeah, I, I and forgot about it, but yeah. That and Living with the Himalayan Masters and um, a few other books that really blew my mind and and changed my perspective on everything. So I went really deep into the spiritual side of yoga and um, very deep into meditation, into the more esoteric and subtle practices. And then I started traveling to India and staying in ashrams and doing really long retreats and meeting different teachers and gurus and vaidyars and going on pilgrimages. Um, So it was really opening my world and the way I related to yoga and I I would say I started to go down a very um, aesthetic route and got very focused on this goal of self-realization and um, and even I would say a little bit more of a masculine lineage of yoga like really trying to follow in the footsteps of my teachers who were all men Mm -hmm. at that time and you know staying at ashrams that were phenomenal and incredible but very aesthetic and very rule oriented and um, things had to be had to be a certain way and I started to feel along the way like "Mm, something is just missing the color is missing from my practice somehow and and then as I started having that feeling suddenly the door opened for me to meet different teachers who brought in more colorful ways of relating to yoga and this is where I started to probably I would say get a bit more into the tantric side and I don't mean the neo-tantra or the way that some people see tantra as sexuality but more of the way of of I am everything Mm -hmm. rather than the path of not this not this not this or not that but I am everything and so that's when my practice also kind of took a different turn as well and um, started to go this was uh, how many years into it since say from the first Bikram class until your yeah so this would be about 10 years wow okay okay yeah I'd say that's a path of about 10 years yeah okay and then I started meeting different teachers who, again, and, and not just teachers, but humans, like different human beings. They didn't have to be a teacher. It could be a child. It could be, and, and not even humans. I should say I spent so much time in nature and receiving from nature and studying from nature and observing, and all this influenced my practice. And I am going to get to your question, but no, go on, we're kind yeah. of taking the long way there. Um, so everything started to influence, and, and it all started coming together. Ayurveda elements, and in this embodied way of life, and, and getting more into movement, and dance, and creativity, and wildness, and catharsis. And so this is where I came across the Osho active meditations. And that just added so much richness and color to my yoga practice. And, and so we can go there in a little bit. but We can digress if you want. Oh, yeah. 
Okay, in, in a bit, I will carry us through. So as we go through all of the Osho active meditations, um, then eventually I met different teachers again, traveled to Nepal. I did a lot with Andre Lapa, and, and that seemed to bring a lot of things together as well for me. That was a really big um, foundation, has been a big foundation for my yoga practice. And, and then I would say the next biggest shift was having a baby. Mm-hmm. And bringing me in onto the path of motherhood, which I would say now is my greatest form of yoga. It's my deepest practice yet. And, and so, of course, that carried its own influence and impact. Um, I became very interested in the process of birth and, and in the process of recovery after birth and, and this um, shifting identity of the mother, of who she is, and really connecting a lot into the feminine energy that was awakened through that process for me. And, and so now my way of relating to yoga is from a very feminine lens and um, bringing the practice of yoga to these different life stages of a woman. So then the, the, main, the main shift that happened was where you became a little bit more interested in the pregnancy side of it was after your own birth. Yes. Yeah. And okay. So, you're, so it, it comes from a place of genuine inquiry, having gone through it, and I'm sure during that experience of childbirth, you asked yourself a few questions that maybe at that point you didn't know the answers for, and then that's more what motivated you to then seek those that information. Yes, mm. absolutely. Okay, okay. Then how does how does like yoga and childbirth what's the what's the link between them? <laughs> They're sisters essentially. Uh-huh. I would say they go together so well. Um, pregnancy is a time of monumental transition and change for a woman on every layer of her being from physical mental emotional spiritual it's all shifting and changing and yoga provides such an incredible framework to experience all those transitions to not only experience them but to embody them and to be in the present moment with them and yoga the practice of yoga gives such an amazing well, framework is one word, but also a, a continuum, I could say, to be able to go through those transitions and changes. And, and also to really prepare a woman for an empowered physiological birth, if she chooses to bring the practice of yoga in that way to help support her. And then also it serves as a continuum on the other side as you enter into the postpartum, into the phase of motherhood. So yoga can be this continuum that can bring you straight across, and all the practices you're doing in the prenatal side can be carried over in the postpartum to, again, help the woman to see who she is not, to see who she is. I mean, that is the practice of yoga, the the yoga, yoga, right? And so, so it's that. That's why I feel they go together so well, and also, Yoga, union, yoking, what other way better to experience this than somatically? Mm. A woman who is pregnant is two as one. Mm. Or if she has twins, she's three as one, you know? She, in that moment, it is a yoking of beings in one body. And so it's a really rich and amazing and magical time to experience yoga. And so I feel like if, if a woman, as she's going through this um, fantastic and monumental and not always pleasant transition, um, the practice of yoga it can offer immense support. Interesting. This is something that, like, as a guy, I will, I will never be able to fully understand. And it's, it's quite interesting, like, what you just said about that whole journey because maybe as a guy or maybe as someone who's not like I don't you know it's <laughs> it's a very foreign topic birth to me is just birth like it's just a normal natural cycle you, you get married you have kids there's no big big like um, it's no big deal it's just like it's normal but then the way you described it there was the the connection there was the being in that moment where you're two in one it's a very special thing and it's something that like I guess it gives me a little bit more understanding of it in a very 
in, in that in that particular way. Hmm. Okay. Um. You, you, you said something about. Uh, I had so many things I wanted to ask at that point. You said something about empowered birth, and what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, this is a little bit of a buzzword lately. Mm. Empowerment. So. If I'm just looking at empowerment itself, to me, this is being able to take responsibility for what is in front of you. Mm-hmm. That life is not happening to you, but it's happening with you. Mm-hmm. And so there's some responsibility there. There's ownership that's there. And in the context of birth, this would be not controlling birth because actually we cannot control anything. anything yeah. um, but we can prepare ourselves, we can inform ourselves of the choices that are there, that we actually do have a choice every step along the way, especially in the context of birth. Women have so many choices that most don't realize they even have. Um, So starting to get familiar with the process of birth, with the choices you have, informing yourself of the risk and the benefits of the choices, and simply taking ownership for your body and for your birth to the degree that you can. Mm. And then through that process, you prepare, you prepare, and then at some point there's a letting go also. There's a surrendering. But you can't surrender if you haven't had it in the first place. Does this make sense? Okay. If you, like if I talk about birth again, one, one attitude could be, well, birth is normal everyone is birthing many people have birthed before me there's nothing i need to prepare for because i'm sure i can trust my body and it's going to do what it needs to do i just show up on the day that birthing happens and i surrender Mm. and that's a that is a beautiful attitude to have but what are you surrendering did you have something in your hands in the first place what are you surrendering at that moment so i like to to share with the women that i'm working with before we surrender let's start to put something in our hands let's start to prepare so what are we preparing for what's your vision of birth what would you, what kind of birth would you like to have so how can we prepare in the best of our capacity to get ourselves to that point and then we can surrender then we surrender to the process and we surrender to mother and baby and to circumstances and to however birth is going to go but we've prepared for plan a b c and d and however many plans we need to have and so to me that is empowerment is taking Ownership for your choices. Uh, I see. Interesting. This okay. And so, is this in the context of like, say, a uh, home birth, or can this be also part of a normal, like a hospital birth? All births, yes. All births, right? All yeah. births. Home birth, hospital birth, for C-section, for orgasmic birth, for water birth, for birth in a hospital bed. It's for all births. And you've had your fair share of experiences playing the role of like a doula. Yeah, I can I can clarify here because there's different um, levels of certification mm-hmm. for doula. So a doula is more of an emotional support for the laboring mother um, as she's birthing. And I have a, a short certification as a doula, but I'm working on a more formally recognized certification mm-hmm. now, so I'm still in training with Childbirth International to complete that. But yes, I've um, assisted... Yeah. several births and supported women during uh, their births how was that like like what how what was your first um assisting experience like was it was it like what you expected were you calm at that point i mean oh, yes. th- at that point you had already given birth right so yes. you sort of know what the mother is going through and then you being there with your knowledge of how to assist emotionally what was going on through your mind at that time Yeah, this is a nice question. First, I would say that actually I have to separate my experience from when I'm coming in to support another woman because if if we think about the scientific side of this, my sample size is one. Ah. So my birth experience does not represent all birth experiences. Right, interesting. And and this is, um, like as a little side note, it's something I share with the trainees um, in the prenatal and postpartum yoga teacher trainings that I run that you don't have to have given birth 
in order yeah. to be a prenatal yoga teacher or a postpartum yoga teacher. Um, you can be a fantastic teacher not having had that specific experience. Just like the doctors that we go to for whatever chronic disease or oh, they don't have to have that disease, that's true. right? And so we can always develop our empathy and our understanding um, and let that be our context. And then our sample size grows with every person that we learn from. And so when I attend births, I actually have to consciously separate my own birth experience from what I'm bringing forward into the one that the laboring mother is having. And when I attended um, my first birth, it was, it's it's an honor. It is such an incredible honor to hold space for a woman as she is traveling between worlds. And I, I feel this is exactly what she does. She's partly here on earth and then she, in a way, disappears between the veils of the universes to go and retrieve her Whoa. baby that she's bringing <laughs> forward. And it's a rite of passage. It's um, It's a moment of no return essentially where the laboring i'm there to support the laboring woman as she herself has to cross this bridge that's in front of her we can help bring her to the bridge but then she has to cross this wow, bridge that's and powerful stuff. it's very powerful and to see the strength of women in this moment is just awe-inspiring and miraculous and incredible and so we help her to get to that point to cross the bridge to then come back as a mother and and this is where i say yoga and and these events like this they go hand in hand because yoga is all about being so present present in in the moment in this in this equanimous state where you're not getting pulled left and right and here and there and aversions and likes and but we're right right there centered in that equanimous moment and it's the same in birth it's the same in postpartum it's the same in mothering these skills carry over so it's not just how you are on the mat this is living yoga and and this is what i see in all of these women and and i attend a lot of births that are happen to be unmedicated and in this way i see the power of breath of presence of resilience, of perseverance, of surrender, of awareness, and all of this combined into one. When, when you're experiencing something so powerful, so painful, and without any anesthetic, at that moment, you're, you, there's, no, there's no way you can hide your true self. Everything is revealed in that moment. That's right. And for you to be able to witness that, that's like intense, man. Yeah. I can... I mean, I am, I'm, I'm shivering. I mean, I'm not shivering, but I feel, I feel tingly, you know, yeah. like hearing this. Ooh, okay. Yeah. How, there's different kinds of, if we relate it back to like the, the yoga and pregnancy, there's postnatal, there's prenatal, there's postpartum. How does that all, how does the practice of that help with the delivery or the, the the after of for for the woman. Oh, tremendously! Like, like say if if like, I, I'm a pregnant woman and I want to go for a prenatal class or a postnatal class. What can I expect? Like, what is this? You yeah. know, what is prenatal? You know, it's interesting that a a lot of women first come to yoga when they're pregnant. Mm. For many. Um, and there will also be some who have been practitioners prior and then they just continue on and come into prenatal. But I do have a lot of first-time yoga practitioners that join when they're pregnant because they heard yoga is good for pregnancy yeah, and good to support birth. So anytime someone comes to yoga, it's the perfect time. As we say, yoga meets you exactly where you are in that moment. And, and because of that, each person will gain something different from the practice. Whatever is meant for them in that moment, that's what they're going to take away from it. So on one level, if we're just talking on the physical level, then 
the, the pregnant body is, sh is shape-shifting like crazy. Every day something is changing. So the joints are softening and opening, the spine is changing shape, the center of gravity is changing, the hormones are changing, the blood volume is changing. So everything is changing like, <laughs> enormously, even from the moment of conception. And, and yoga helps to give a way to lean into those changes to connect to the body and i'd say that's even the starting place in pregnancy especially for women who don't have a prior yoga practice it it helps them to connect to their body okay this is my body this is how it's changing this is how it feels right now it gives some proprioception i can can, here's my leg this is where i can move my leg and my arm and here's my breath and i can be aware of my breath while I'm moving my body so it really helps to connect a woman to her body and this goes for anyone right anyone who comes into yoga but in pregnancy you have this connection to the body and to the breath and the more that you can establish this this will serve the expectant mom in labor so much because labor <clears throat> and I would say this is if she's going into an empowered birth where she she wants to be the one who is experiencing, not that birth is happening to her from doctors that decide they're going to do this and that, but she is fully aware and in her body of what's happening. So the practice of yoga helps bring her to that state, to have an immense capacity of presence, to be able to use the breath to ride through the surges that come in the body that are helping to birth baby. Um, and then in other ways, um, the body's becoming so flexible and loose because you have these hormones like called relaxin is one of them that's helping to soften all the joints during pregnancy so that the pelvis can open so that baby can come down and navigate out and so yoga gives a way to help work with that newfound flexibility so it gives us um, we can have ways to stabilize the joints that are becoming loose to bring mobility to them to even on in ways to relieve low back pain, to help address issues of carpal tunnel, to help address um, breath issues, like it's harder to breathe as you're becoming pregnant or growing in your pregnancy. So you can address a lot of the physical challenges during pregnancy and physical complications. Um, but you know, I feel deeper than that is just the connection that the woman can have to her baby and to her body as it's going through all these changes. And, and then these tools are all helpful for the birth itself, as well as I also want to mention um, helping baby to get in the optimal position for birth. And okay. not many people realize that, that the position of the baby will have a huge impact yeah. on the type of birth experience that the woman has. And there's something called optimal fetal positioning, where there's a certain position of so baby that's the best. Is head down yeah. and usually is it's called LOA left occipital anterior so it's where the spine of the baby is towards the belly of the mother slightly to the left and um, yoga asanas are fantastic to help get baby into that more optimal position as well um, and then of course you can open on the, the flexibility of the pelvis and you can balance the pelvic floor and just many different um, wonderful advantages of prenatal yoga okay and this is all this is prenatal this is okay this is prenatal yeah and then what's postnatal about yeah and you've used a few words now postnatal and postpartum yes. so i want to give a distinction to those because um, postpartum is what i have liked to call the yoga that we offer for mothers after they have given birth whether it's recently or it's 10 years later, okay. post postpartum is always postpartum. So postpartum means parting of the fetus from the mother. And actually that could be for miscarriage or it can be for giving mm -hmm. birth. It's when the mother has parted with the fetus. Okay. It's a mother-centric term. And this is the difference between the word postpartum and postnatal. Postnatal refers to baby, whereas postpartum is mother-centric. and and here in Singapore at home yoga, the classes I offer following birth are, I like to call them postpartum, mm -hmm. postpartum yoga. Because it's for the mommy. Because it's for the mother, <laughs> right. yes. Okay. Yeah. Then is it, it's for, it's, 
like the classes are restorative or are they energetic? Um, well, they're a little bit of both. Um, right now I'm offering something called a foundation series, postpartum yoga foundation series. And so available on your website. Yes, and <laughs> we'll so talk about it later. the whole there's a story to all of this. Um, should I share that story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. After I gave birth, Ooh, um, a personal story. Yes, a personal story. I really wanted to come back into my asana practice. Yeah. And I could do a little bit on my own, but I wanted more support. I, I wanted to come to a class, actually, and have guidance because I know my body really well. But after giving birth, I didn't recognize it anymore. I didn't way, know like where strength. my core was. Yeah, I couldn't find my core. I, I didn't. It's it's like I wanted my body to move a certain way and it couldn't. I went from having an an um, quite, I say, progressive asana practice to suddenly feeling like I had gone backwards by several years, if not more, almost back to the beginning. That's mm. how it felt. Um, because my body didn't seem to function the same way. And, and it wasn't that it just couldn't function, it was that I didn't recognize it. And so I started to seek guidance in other places. And, I, and one, I realized I couldn't find what I was looking for. I was looking for a postpartum yoga class, but I couldn't find that. There are plenty of moms and bobs classes, which are so wonderful. These are for helping to bond mother and baby together. But I was already doing a lot of that at home. This is how we're raising our daughter. She's been doing yoga with us since she was born. So I couldn't find something that was focused on the mother. And then additionally, there was parts of my body that were not functioning very well. And so then I started to go to a women's health um, physio, like a pelvic health physiotherapist to gain some insight and help that way. And it just launched me into this very deep postpartum recovery for myself where I didn't have the intention to teach this to anybody. I just wanted to heal myself and heal my body, restore my body, rebuild my body and reconnect to my body and to my changing identity and always knowing that the identity is impermanent but but still what, what is this impermanent identity that I have now as a mother and so that is what just sprung me into the deep end of what I'm calling now postpartum yoga where I started to bring all my experience together my experience of healing my own body working with the pelvic health physios and um, some of the different courses and trainings that I took during that time that I found online with physiotherapists. And so I put it all together to create what now has been um, refined to, uh, down to postpartum yoga. And then in 2000, no, I can't remember if it was 2017 or 2018, but Malvina, founder of Home, asked me to, to start teaching prenatal and postpartum yoga at home. And I did that, and the challenge that I ran into is that I would always have new mothers coming in to the postpartum class with some mothers that had been with me for quite a long time, or women that were coming that they had given birth maybe 10 years ago, and they were joining the class. And so I had these different um, situations in the class, and it was really hard to go back to the basics when some people were ready to progress. Right. So that's how I formed the Foundation Yoga series. Mm -hmm. And in this series, it's all about reconnecting mother to her body. So we're, we start with posture and breath and pelvic floor balancing and deep core stabilization and, and put all this together so then she can move safely and confidently into more progressive asanas and vinyasas. And, or to whatever she's doing, other exercises or activities, or just moving more confidently in her daily life. Hmm, this is interesting. And I, I, it's an interesting thing to hear because for, for having af after having given birth, the body of the woman does feel different. Maybe it's been uh, nine months of carrying weight in front of you then now suddenly that weight is lifted oh the, the, the shoulders feel a little bit loose or the back feels a bit different yeah. and 
nine months of not doing anything, let's say uh, practicing yoga, you, you, you didn't go yoga for nine months and then now you go back to a vinyasa class, you, it's going to be different. You might struggle in your chaturanga or your yes. vinyasa. And then maybe that, um, that, that, that experience does make you feel like the body is a bit foreign. Like, eh? uh, you know, a year ago I could, I could handstand easily. Now I, yeah. I, I struggle with a chaturanga. Yeah. And then because of that, what you've experienced, it made you want to, again, seek out that, like, that understanding of like, what, what, where did this um, disconnect come from and how can I reconnect? Yes, exactly. And then, and then you, you found it, you, 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 you shaped it into your own thing and now it's, now it's the point where you can then share that information with other people. Hmm. I mean, I've, I've spoken to a few pregnant uh, ma- uh, yogi ma- yoga mummies before mm-hmm. and then they told me about how like, yeah, like when uh, third trimester or something, they get a bit loose, they feel very energetic and then afterwards, afterwards they, they give birth or they feel a bit different and it's something that I guess not a lot of women at that stage would feel. Hmm, interesting, interesting. Yes, and also I think that there's um, there's a need for supporting women uh, this way. Yeah, because, because it's be, not yeah, there. Because after you give birth, people are like, all right, you're, you're, you're good, you're, yes. it's all over, congrats, and then like the party's yeah, over. But then this right. you gotta you gotta figure out like all the how to how to reconnect with your body. There might be postpartum depression and whatever postpartum stuff that the mommy's facing, yeah. how does she go back into it? Exactly. You know? And there's a huge pressure from society to bounce back, to return back. To work, know. to whatever. Yes, and we see it in celebrities all the time that get, they can get your look, body back in shape. Right, they look the next day like yeah. they haven't even had a baby and <laughs> you know, there's there's a huge amount of pressure and then also even within the birthing community there's this idea that after six weeks that you should be fine you're you're cleared to go to exercise after six weeks and this it's like the six weeks is this magic number and and i think we set women up for disappointment in a way that they're expecting their bodies to be like they were pre-pregnancy by six weeks after birth and and we have to remember that Everybody's different. Uh. Everyone's different, but but she went through an orthopedic injury. Like this is a major musculoskeletal injury. Even if she had the smoothest, m- easiest vaginal delivery, it's still a significant injury to the body, and it takes time to restore. And and we can easily say if someone you know tears their ACL that oh yeah, you're going to be out for a while and you're going to take about a year for your recovery. But it's like we view birth totally differently and we just have this pressure on women to bounce back. And and for women who had a C-section, that's major abdominal surgery, you know? So I feel like there's this huge need to support women after birth and, and to just be there to help them along their way because becoming a mother is not easy. <laughs> And it has so many of its own layers and and difficulties that are there. And so if we're setting women up for disappointment and have all this pressure on them, you know, we're we're not really helping their journey into motherhood very well. So I feel like there's a really big need for this. And what I'm seeing now is that as women come through the postpartum yoga foundation and and by the way, if, I'm sure there's other things like this out there in other places. This just kind of came through from my personal need, and then I wanted to share from this one perspective. But I, the women coming through the foundation, I see that they are able to reconnect to their core, and their, the core is not just your abdominal muscles, that's only a tiny part of it. Our core is from the, the diaphragm, the pelvic floor, the transversus abdominis, the mul- multifidae in the back, the spinal muscles, like our real core center. When a woman is able to connect there, and then connecting with her breath, and then eventually connecting with the rest of her body, she forms this confidence to be in this changing body, in this new body confidence to be in it, a confidence to move, and that confidence is is so essential for her path on motherhood. Um, and also through this yoga foundation, she's able to reconnect to, hopefully to intuition, to her presence, to her breath, and this can only serve us as we go further. And I see 
the women as they come out of this, it's a four class series and I see very big improvements for women and I see them taking quite big steps in their recovery and from here they can go on to you know we have other just ongoing postpartum classes that start to get more into vinyasas and um, building the practice basically or they can go into other classes um, yeah I think it serves a real need right now I think so too um. As you can see, I get excited talking on and on about this. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, for sure. Like, keep talking about it because it's something that it is interesting, and and I want to know. And and like, what's interesting also, I keep I keep saying interesting, but what's it, what is interesting is that you came from this place where you you had no intention to teach. You just wanted to figure it out. That's that's kind of like the best way to get into it because. You're not thinking about like, oh, how can I make a career out of this? So it's more of like really, I've I felt this way. I've given birth in a, and I've experienced these things, and then I want to like, hey, well, how come this is happening to me? Is any is this happening to anybody else? Let me go and do my own research. Hey, it turns out that this is happening because of this is this. Yes. Well, who else is feeling this? I need to you know I want to build a community. I want to um, make sure that that women out there are empowered. They're not alone. That 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 this is normal. You need to know it's not six weeks. It's it could be seven weeks for you. It could be eight weeks for you. It's fine. We're all in this together. And it, you come from that place where it's very authentic and it's very, um, you know, you're driven, you're motivated in that way. So so it's very inspiring. Oh, thank yeah. you. I I thank you for saying that. I you know what, I think my whole life has been this way because I never I never set out to teach yoga. It was never something in my mind that I said, I want to teach yoga. I didn't ever have that. It was like existence just something happened, pushed me in that direction. Happened, yeah. And it's the same thing with, um, I ran a community in Singapore for a number of years. Um, Let's talk about that. And that okay. <laughs> yeah, that came about the mm. same way. And so it's kind of the pattern that I have that um, as much as I sometimes have a reluctancy to share and teach things uh, existence has other plans and it just kind of nudges me in that direction and um but the beauty of that is that my heart is fully in it yeah that's the that's the it's almost like a calling already like you yeah. sort of like you sort of have to at that point really you know you have to 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 bring carry on that information already to the next generation so you have this community that you started in singapore Yes. <laughs> you, uh, you want to It's hear called that? Satsanga. Satsanga. Sat- yeah. I, I I think I, Sat Satsang is uh truth or something. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, sat- I know what Sat Sat yeah. But what is Sangha sp- is like a gathering, right? Ah, and so right. so Satsanga, I named it that the full name is Singa Satsanga. Uh, Singa for Singapore, Sat for truth, and Sangha for gathering. gathering. So it's this gathering of truth. Okay. Yeah. What's it about? Well, um, as always, I have long stories for everything. We got time. So, <laughs> um, well, this happened when I was, let's see, I was here in Singapore as a postdoc working um, in for ASTAR doing bone tissue engineering. and. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, the sidetrack yeah. for a bit. You have a okay. PhD in biomedical engineering. Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> just, just don't throw that out there. Yeah, yeah. Could, could I you... happen to have that yeah. in my pocket. <laughs> um, yeah, it's why I came to Singapore. I got recruited by uh, um, some professors at A Star when they were at a conference in the U.S. and invited me to come over. So I was running a, I was doing a postdoc position and studying bone tissue engineering and re- figuring out ways to regrow bone when it couldn't do it by itself in the body, like bone defects or bone disease. And it was really fascinating research. Um, I love the creativity of all of it, but there are a lot of, um, let's just say, political and ethical challenges in the field of science that I was in here. And um, at some point, I felt really strongly that this is not my calling. And I, at that time, was taking a lot of refuge, as I had been in my yoga practice. And yoga, I mean, not just asana, but really in the, the subtle practices of as, well. as well. It was my lifeline, mm. yeah. 
And so I came to a point where I realized I have to jump ship and I have to leave academic research. Mm. And that, that was a huge decision. And it was one of the first times in my life I realized, wow, I didn't, I, I didn't think I was identifying with labels, but I was. And it was this big shakeup of my identity because now I wasn't known as Amber the Scientist anymore. And I felt that there was a lot of disappointment to family members and to people that knew me, you know, that I'm just leaving something that could have been a prestigious career. Um, some of that might have been in my head, but it was a really big identity challenge. And, and so that's when I left to go to India, um, kept a base in Singapore, but I went for a couple of months in India and just going deeper in my yoga and meditation and trying to figure out what am I doing with my life and that kind of that sounds like a very <laughs> that, happens. That, so, that sounds like a very like um you know the the, the scholar who quit his job yeah. and then like went to India. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. <laughs> but yeah, but it was it must have been very trying for you coming from a place of uh, a medical field and then you transition to something more holistic. Yeah, and How, what inspired that shift? Well. You know, it's not like I left one for the other because, as I had said, I've been, I've been relating to yoga since by that time for about six years. So since um, ninety nine two thousand, and also I've been studying Ayurveda. And at the time that I decided to leave my scientific position, I was also apprenticing with an Ayurvedic doctor, and so I was learning more about Ayurveda. And that was. So part of the appeal to go to India was to just immerse myself in those things place, I was already yeah. interested in. And um, and so then when I was there, I happened to meet uh, a teacher of uh, meditation and I, I stayed there for some time and it really had a huge impact on me. So when I came back to Singapore, I wanted to share the meditation methods with my friends. And at that time, my friends were primarily my stressed out science colleagues. And so they said, well, you don't have a job now, Amber, so why don't you <laughs> share meditation with us? <laughs> and so um, I opened up my apartment, my home, which is the one I still live in now. And I opened it up one room and I asked my friends come and we'll meditate together. Mm -hmm. So we did and they were really enjoying that. And then I happened to bring the teacher from India over. He said he would share these methods um, with more friends if I wanted to gather of people together. And so this is one of the first times in Singapore, I think, that a yoga studio would allow itself to be rented out for something other than yoga from the yoga teachers there. So I, I asked, um, at this time it was the Wabi Sabi Yoga Studio in Clark Key, and I asked them, can I rent your studio just to have a teacher from India lead meditation here? And they said yes. And so I brought all my science colleagues and many other people I didn't know showed up for it. and and. We did this regularly for about a few weeks as the teacher was here and the teacher left and we all wanted to keep practicing. So I said, okay, I, I will invite you to my home and we can do it there. And no one wanted to facilitate meditation. So I said, all right, I'll do it. Yeah. You know, I don't really want to, but I will. And again, they're saying, well, you don't have a job, so you might as well do it. <laughs> and so I started sharing meditation and then eventually started sharing yoga mm -hmm. from my practice. I was not certified as a teacher. I just, it's like they kept asking me and I, yeah. I couldn't say no. And I said, all right. So I started doing things on donation and the classes started to grow. And these friends brought more friends and more friends and more friends. And so I cleared the furniture from the whole house. I only left my bedroom and half of my bedroom. I, I left as part of my my private space and ended up clearing all the furniture out and made my apartment like a little ashram in the city oh. and and from there I began yeah I just continued sharing and this grew into a community and so a couple of years in I called it Singha Satsanga and um, it grew and grew and and we did this for about almost eight years until my daughter was born and and through that time had many visiting teachers come and wow. we we did a lot of things together kirtans and uh, 
potluck dinner nights and movie nights and mm. yoga meditation retreats I started leading retreats and organizing them for other teachers and it was a huge learning experience and I never intended to do that it just organically happened and it became a way of life and it gave me such meaning to be in Singapore and um, I felt I found some kind of purpose that was there and and it has continued to this day in different forms people from the community have carried it on in their own ways in their homes and it's kind of spread out to other countries as well so that's been so beautiful to see that it was like a little dandelion that oh, you blow it yeah. and the seeds go everywhere it's pity that it had to stop a lot, but, but yeah. Yeah, but you know, I see it as perfect because, like, this also comes through yoga is when you're going to love, you love with an open hand. We don't love clenching our fist and holding something really tight. That's not how we love. That's, that's grabbing, that's trying to keep something. But if we truly love and we love freely, we love with an open hand. And that means when it's time for whatever is there to go, it, it goes, but we keep loving it. And, and this is how I see satsanga. I love it with an open hand. And, and that meant when it was time to change and to shape shift, it was time to do so. And, and I saw the beauty in it because many people from this community, the relationships have been very deep still to this day and so many people started their own things and continued to spread the light out and, and that to me is the greatest purpose of these gatherings is that we just inspire one another to keep growing and keep sharing so that's what it did that's nice that's nice um how did how did you go from satsanga to establishing embodiment women yoga ah uh, the embodied yo embodied yeah. women yoga yeah. well that was definitely not right away we it kind of relates to some of the things we've been talking about but after i had my daughter um i i couldn't keep my home open for the yeah, community for to come reasons, in yeah. and actually i tried for the full first year of her being a newborn my husband and i tried to keep the house open and we would continue the meditations, other people would lead them, and I would walk around the neighborhood with Aya in my little baby carrier and while people meditated in my home. And so we tried, but then it became really difficult. So after that, that's when the community kind of spread out to other places around Singapore. And I went very deep in, into my own process. I wasn't ready to share. I didn't I didn't feel the calling to teach anything, to hold space for others, actually. I, I felt this immense call to be with my daughter and, and my husband to form this triad together. And so I really stayed in this little cocoon for quite a while. And that was a very deep process in itself that was certainly was not easy and it was not always joyful. Um, but it was a, a necessary absolutely necessary yeah it's like the the chrysalis in mm. the cocoon and it's the clay in the oven and and i feel like this probably could be replicated by many women who look back and describe their postpartum period especially the first few years postpartum mm. and so in that kind of chrysalis period that's where I was gaining all these different experiences that were full of light and full of shadow and basically contribute to where I am now and it's where I became so interested in women's health and women's um, empowerment through particularly through pregnancy birth and postpartum and this idea of of looking at yoga in particular from a feminine lens and that's when I also started to realize I have a lot of wonderful teachers in, that have influenced me on the path of yoga, but coincidentally, most of them have been men, and not a single one of them could I really talk to about the cyclical nature of a woman. And, and by this, I mean the cyclical nature through the month and then also through our life stages. And 
And how do we adapt our yoga practice to that cyclical nature? Because everything I had learned from these incredible teachers was very linear and actually quite masculine. And I think that there's a reason for that because most are male teachers teaching for males. I mean, at least that's how it was some time ago. But now we've kind of taken some of the practices and tried to adapt them to our current society and et cetera. But, but essentially, traditional practices of yoga are quite masculine in their nature, at least the ones that I was um, having exposure to. And so during this postpartum phase is when I started to really question and to feel into my body, what do I need right now? What does my body need? And it's not this linear path. It's more of an intuitive path and feeling-based path. And it changed the way that I practice yoga. And then I started to dive more deeply into that and, and started to say, hey, wait a second. Okay, this is not about male and female, but this is about honoring the feminine and the masculine. And with feminine energy, it's really cyclical and it's very, um, oftentimes very receptive and feeling based and intuitive. And so how might that change the way that we show up on the mat and, and how we relate to yoga as a practice? So I started to go deeper into that and then fast forward a bit. Um, all of that came together to what I call embodied woman yoga. And, and I actually launched this in COVID 2020. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. because I finally had the space to, to do that yeah. where everything slowed down and I, I you know had a little bit more spaciousness to work since lost all of my outer work. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that's something really beautiful that came from this time as I was able to formulate all this to put together embodied woman yoga. And, and that includes the teacher trainings that I run and also some new content that I'm slowly starting to put out, which is related to women's pelvic health and embodiment empowerment. Wow. Okay. Keeping busy. And there's a lot of things. I think I, there's a lot of things that I wanted to sidetrack in, for everything that you said. There was one part where you mentioned um, uh, the life cycle of women. Uh, the life wanna, stages. Yeah, yeah, life stages. Yeah, women women have several life stages that we could kind of archetypes almost, but also phases that we go mm-hmm. through. So we have before we get our menstruation, our menses, okay, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, okay, and then <laughs> we have menarche when we get the menstruation. So we have puberty there. Mm-hmm. So you have your menstruating years then you can oh this is based on age the age um, of it it's, so not, like it's the, actually on the menstrual cycle because so it's within a month no this is within the, the, the life, life stages oh, yeah okay. so you can go from um, being pre-pubescent right. right and then the woman gets her menstruation mm. it's called menarche when she has her first bleed. oh okay I didn't I, yeah. I never knew that that word existed yeah, yeah okay. it's a word called menarche and then this can take her to her like sexual maturation and then if she chooses or if she goes down this path it's not always a choice for every woman but there can be pregnancy okay there can be the um, postpartum phase then we can go into the next phase is perimenopause okay and yeah this kind of is about 10 years or so before menopause takes place and menopause is just a cessation of a releasing of the eggs and no more menstruation mm. okay? and so the final stage is menopause and so throughout all these changes a, a woman is experiencing quite significant hormonal shifts and her physicality is changing her emotions her mentality um, even her the spiritual way of relating to herself it's all changing during these stages so those are the life stages and then when menstruation starts um, in those years every month a woman is cycling and actually even after her menstruation ends she still goes through monthly cycles women are very much connected to the moon mm. and so it's is our lunar cycle and even through this 28 day or so cycle we have incredible hormonal shifts as well that are taking place there that are normal we are not supposed to be flatlined we are not supposed to be linear in our 
mood and our energy. Women are cyclical. They are meant to go up and down. And we have this kind of yang expression and yin expression, just like the moon does as well. Okay. That's... uh, I can agree with that. (laughs) How does that relate to yoga? This is a good question too. (laughs) Okay, if we're just talking about asana, so the asana part of yoga, for example, um, for a linear practice, so one that's non-cyclical, you could do the same type of asana practice every day. Mm. And and that person would probably have benefit from that, refining and perfecting. And let's say it was something like Ashtanga. Ashtanga yeah. And it's, it's set, it has a structure, you can pretty much put the same energy in, same energy out. There will be definitely nuances and differences from day to day, but the practice kind of stays the same. Mm. Um, that would be a really linear approach. But for a cyclical approach, you're looking more at your energy and where you are when you when you come to the mat. I want to be careful as I say this because you can do that within Ashtanga also. You can feel into what kind of energy you have and then that's going to be your output. Okay, I recognize that. But from a larger perspective, for a woman who is cyclical in nature, it, through the month of her, yeah, I'll just say through her month, her energy is going to shift. So when she's bleeding, this is when her energy is very um, descending and it, it's contracted and it's going inwards. It's very inwards and it's a time of rest, actually. Okay. After she stops bleeding, this is when the energy slowly starts to rise. So the yang aspect of her cycle is coming. This is when she can start to return to her asana practice gently, not forcefully, and starting to bring in a little bit more yang expression, starting to slowly introduce inversions again, if that was in her practice, as she works her way up to ovulation, which is like the full moon of her practice. It's the peak of her cycle. And so this is when her practice could have the most energy and be the most rigorous and the most yang and then after ovulation we start the descent again and so this is like the descending moon when we're headed towards the dark night basically so we start to so foreboding yeah we but it's there's beauty in this if we recognize the strengths of each part of the cycle so her practice yoga practice or asana practice would change where it starts to slow down a bit starts to go more inward eventually as we get premenstrual and then heading in back again towards mm. menstruation the practice changes and it's to reflect her energy and where she is and if she would adopt her practice in this cyclical way it will have a profound effect on how she experiences her menstruation and her ovulation and also her premenstrual symptoms that she might mm. have it has a huge impact and so this is a cyclical way that you can approach an asana practice. Sorry, you, you said cyclical a lot of times. Yeah, what does sorry. it mean? <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> it's okay. like, um, it cyclical. goes up and down? Yes, is that what yeah, you mean? Yeah, yeah. So it, it okay. has cycles, basically. Okay, okay. Yeah, whereas linear is just, it's just you start like, here and you go oh, yeah, the end okay. up there. Which is a more a masculine sort of yes. energy, whereas feminine is more cyclical. Yes, yeah. Okay. And if you think about the moon, the moon is cyclical mm. because you have the dark night then you have the new moon and then it starts to grow and it's ascending and it gets to be the full moon and then it's going to start descending it's slowly Mm. disappearing until you come back to the dark night okay (laughs) so in this way like really simply it means to to be in tune with yourself where are you where am i right now and what do i need what does my body need through my asana practice, through my pranayama practice, through my meditation, through my food, through my relationships. What do I need right now? Mm. And look, this is how it all comes together. That is yoga. This is embodied yoga, being so present. It's an embodied consciousness. And this serves everyone. But I I see particularly how it can serve women because that's what i'm mostly interested Mm. in right now is i want to say it serves everyone but but absolutely this can serve women to really empower themselves for how they show up in the world and go through these life stages (laughs) okay (laughs) is it too much no it's just it's it's in i feel like i'm learning a lot about 
moon cycles yes. <laughs> and pregnancies. Every man should learn this. E- yeah, and like I'm, I'm like a bit embarrassed also because of the nature of the topic. But it's also like uh, it makes sense. Like if I think back or if I relate it back to certain instances, like yeah, okay, it makes sense. If I look look at pregnant people and how they practice, yeah, okay, certain things make sense. If I think back on my pregnant friends and how they uh, are changing in that way, yeah, it, it, it's very in it's very knowledgeable stuff. I think it's so fantastic <sighs> that we are having this yeah. conversation because I wish so much that every man would start to learn more about mm-hmm. this because then the way that they understand women will will be it's a little bit more so much. yeah a, a little bit more. Um, empathy, a little bit more compassion. Yes. Because as a guy, like, oh, you're you're angry or you're upset. Oh, you must be on your period. It's a very, mm-hmm. it's a very in in um. What's the word I'm looking for? Insincere or in, yeah, and it's, it's not very, very yeah, empathetic. It's, yeah. So you're just sort of like, oh, it's just because you're on yeah. period, like ha ha ha. Yes. But, but when you you understand it on a, on a very on a deeper level, where it is something so empowering, it is something so special. The cycles, the moons, the what you're feeling, the peak of the energy, mm-hmm. the fall of it, all this tells a story. Absolutely. And it's a very, and it is the story of what it means to be a female, like that feminine, the femininity, and about owning that. Because, I guess in, as a, as a guy, it's, we're very simple. We're very like you know, yes is yes, no is no. We're very simple creatures. We want to. We're hungry. We go eat. We we you know it's very simple. But then for women, it's a little bit more um, different. It's a little bit more complicated. Not in a, not in a negative way, but in a in a. I don't know in 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 a, in, a, in an intellectual way maybe. Oh yes, yeah, and in a in a fluid way. A, Things yeah. are always shifting. What's the word they used again? Like the si- cyclical. Yeah, it's a, in a cyclical way. So it's just different, yeah. and you need. The cyclical and the the strong yes, that's right. energy to to balance to you need the waves to push the boat mm-hmm. you need the stability of the boat and then the wildness of the waves to be able to lead yourself in, in yeah, that's this a is nice an analogy, analogy from Malvina that's really yeah. nice yeah it's true and I wish that I really do wish that every man could have this conversation and well, could get to know women in it from a different perspective and and of course for women to understand men too but and, and also i want to say for yoga teachers mm. um we have a lot we do have a lot of male yoga teachers and i think it'd be fantastic if they understood the cyclical nature of women more and could even in their classes understand what what kind of pose variations can we give for women when they're menstruating and to be comfortable offering that as a variation or if you have a pregnant woman come into class how can you support her or to now be aware that okay has anyone given birth within the last three years if so these are some things that you want to look out for and watch out for. and it's also um for the the female practitioner as well understanding her body understanding her cycles her peaks and her falls and how and what she needs at that point in the practice, whether she needs to tone it down, whether yeah. she she wants to express, you know, to, to manage that energy within the mm-hmm. within the constraints of the man. Yes, exactly. Mm. Okay. So this is all empowerment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about Ayurveda. Okay. And your 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 tw- your titi is elemental yoga. Uh, oh yeah, I, I'm a lead trainer on one that is five elements yoga teacher mm. training. What is that? I like what is that and how does it tie into Ayurveda if it even does? Yes, it yeah. does actually. Um so five elements yoga is fire, water wood? Is that wood or is it that... Yeah, that's from the TCM side. So from ah. the Ayurveda side you have fire um earth, water, fire, wind and space. And from the TCM side, earth, water, fire metal and wood ah, right. okay. and so um, five elements yoga as the TT is called or what I share from my own practices elemental yoga they're the same thing um, is nothing new it's mainly just hatha yoga overlaid with knowledge of the elements and the meridian channels within mm. the body and it's a I use this as a framework for pretty much all the asana practices that I create um, because I just resonate with it so much 
but the idea is 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 kind of a blend from TCM and Ayurveda, but the idea is that we have channels that are carrying energy in our body, chi or prana, and these channels, specifically the meridians, are related to um, the five elements in the sense that they're connected to organ systems, which are organ pairs, and each organ system correlates with an element and has specific meridians. Right. So, for example, you have the earth, element is connected to stomach and spleen meridians and another example the water elements connected to bladder and kidney meridians and so if we know where these channels run in the body then we know then that particular asanas are going to stretch or strengthen these meridian channels okay in a general way um, not as specific as acupuncture or acupressure but still we are moving and twisting and strengthening stretching the body and this is why when you have a really well-rounded asana practice, you, you probably will feel incredible from it because you stimulated everything, is, everything yeah. yeah, all those channels. But the, the wonderful thing about this way of practicing is your, your asana and your pranayama practice can become very therapeutic because you can understand that, right, what do I need to invoke more of? What kind of qualities do I need right now? Do I need to on an emotional way? Do I need to feel more safe, more belonging, to feel home, to feel grounded and have this steadiness and, and endurance and strength? Okay, I need an earth practice. So let me work the stomach and spleen lines a little bit. And so then you can adjust your asana practice to move energy along those lines. So this is, I use this as a framework for even my prenatal and my postpartum. I'm always thinking about organ systems and how we can help bring harmony to the energy along those channels mm -hmm. and does that answer your question? Yeah, um, uh, what's the difference between TCM and Ayurveda? They're sort of one and the same, I think. Well, not really. They, they have truths that overlap, but right. one is coming from China, so TCM is traditional China. Chinese medicine, and one's coming from India, India, Ayurveda. So they're actually two very different systems, but when you overlay them, there are a lot of commonalities, but just described with a different vocabulary and from oh, a different angle. Okay, okay. Um, I do find that if you're mixing the systems, it can sometimes get confusing because it looks like there's contradictions mm. in some places. Um, it's actually not when you go to the deeper levels, um, but for simplicity, it's probably good to choose a system that you're going to work from. Okay. Okay, I have a few last few questions, and these are all um, just stuff that I wanted to know. I mean, but it's also tied to what we're talking about. Okay. So, um, what is a birth labyrinth? Oh, the birth <laughs> labyrinth. <laughs> this is such a beautiful concept. This I came across this from a woman named Pam England, and I believe she's a midwife, and she also, I came across it in her book, mm -hmm. and the book might be called The Birth Labyrinth, I can't remember, or Labyrinths of Birth, I can't remember. I think it's the second one. I think I remember Googling that. Yeah, birth, I yeah I, so I came across this concept from her and from... The birthing within community and it's the idea that so for a lot of our listeners they probably have come across labyrinths before we have a labyrinth is almost like a maze. sort of like a maze but you're trying to work your way from the entrance to the center and it's not a spiral because a spiral has one very clear direction that it's going but a labyrinth will have once you enter, it will have a lot of different twists and turns to where you think you're getting to the center, but then you actually go back around towards the periphery, and then you, you think you're at the periphery, but you're working your way to the center. So it's unclear. Once you enter the labyrinth, it's unclear how far you are towards your goal, towards the center. And we use labyrinths across many cultures and traditions. and. Even now, you can do walking labyrinths that you can physically walk in as part of a meditation to be very present with each step, not knowing where you are in the labyrinth. So you're not focused on the end result, you're focused on the process. And there's a lot of um, beautiful extrapolations you can make to life lessons, etc., by using the symbol of the labyrinth. Mm -hmm. And so the labyrinth also can represent hero's journey 
and the hero's journey is this philosophical idea that we see Joseph Campbell yes through yeah. Joseph Campbell did a lot with that and we see it through a lot of movies and stories and and one version of this hero's journey is that you have um, the preparation yeah. you have the ordeal and you have the return so it's kind of like the again the framework that we're coming up a lot today um, and so Pam England took this idea and said, well, birth is much like a labyrinth because before you enter the labyrinth, you have your, your preparation and your preparation can be unconscious and conscious. And the unconscious would be you born into this life and all your life experiences that kind of lead you up to this moment now. And the conscious preparation would be like, let's say if a woman did birth preparation classes and she worked with a doula and she did prenatal yoga and she looked up what kind of foods to eat and books to read, etc. That's her preparation. So her pregnancy is her whole preparation. And she's standing at the labyrinth at the threshold. The moment that labor starts, she's entered the labyrinth and she's going through these twists and turns. And this is what I meant earlier, is that you can prepare and prepare and prepare. You're empowering yourself. But when birth starts, when labor starts, that's when there's a surrendering because we cannot control the outcome. So before you enter the labyrinth, you're surrendering. Okay, I'm entering the labyrinth now. I don't know how long it's gonna take me to get to the center. I don't know what the center is gonna look like. I'm just going to keep putting one step in front of the other. And that's what labor is. It's full of these twists and turns. You think you're about to birth baby and then you're not. You're, you're pretty, still pretty far away. Or you, you think you're really far away, but actually baby's just around the corner. And, mm. and so it's a lot of unknowns in there requiring you to be fully present. Again, this is how yoga supports a woman in this process. Okay, being fully present in her body, communicating with baby the whole time, and eventually making your way to the center of the labyrinth, which is the birth of the baby. But that's not the end. Just like a wedding is not the end of a marriage, it's just the beginning. And so the birth of the baby is the birth of the mother. And now she has to work her way out of the labyrinth, Whoa. which is the postpartum journey which is full again of twists and turns, of unknowns. You think you have a handle on this new identity, but you don't, you're so far away. Or you think, I'm never gonna get a handle on this, but then you are, you're really close. So it's this twist and turns of unknowns, again, a lot of surrender, a lot of acceptance. Again, this is where the yoga practice, that con continuum supports you. Until eventually, who knows when, it's different for every woman, could be couple of years, could be three years, five years, could be more, when she finally feels like I've made it out of the labyrinth, I'm established in who I am, I can share and connect and, and help others now, I can speak from a place of wisdom, she's found her solid ground and so she's out of that labyrinth, probably to find herself in another labyrinth at that point. But that's why I love this visual so much because it captures a lot of what um, for birth, what are you going what, through? Yeah, it's a, it's also it can also be a representation of, of or an analogy for any kind of difficulty that you yes, face in life, regardless absolutely. of birth. Yeah. Whew, I like that. I like yeah. that. That was, that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Let's okay. see. Um, what is your view on fertility, from a holistic perspective? Oh, that's a really big question, but I'll try to make it a bit brief. Um, well, holistic is the key word. So my my perspective brings, I should say what creates my perspective. It's coming from yoga, from Ayurveda, from natural living, holistic living, and attunement with cycles again. Mm -hmm. So for fertility can be of body or mind. Right? So fertility doesn't mean just to be able to create babies, but it could also be fertility of how you birth projects and ideas and your ability to create. And so regardless of which type of fertility you're talking about, I think the approach is the same. If it's holistic, you're working from body, um, mind, emotions, and spirit all together. And so that means if we, if we talk about the koshas in yoga, it's having all these koshas in alignment and, and vibrating with similar frequency. 
it's outer and inner alignment essentially so that could look like um okay how can i attune my life so that my koshas are aligned well how's my physical body right now what kind of nourishment do i need to give it what kind of foods do i need to give it how's my sleep cycle am i rising and setting with the sun am i unplugging at night what kind of um, you know, how am I nurturing my body and tending to my body? Then to the breath, Kosha, how am I breathing? How is my breath? Am I stressed? Am I chest breathing? Am I fully diaphragmatically breathing? How is my nervous system? Okay, going in even further to the Manomaya Kosha, what kind of information and stimulus am I feeding to myself right now? What are the stories I surround myself with? What are um, what am I mentally taking in and digesting? How is the state of my mind? How is the ac activity of my mind? Go to the emotional layer. What am I, how are my relationships serving me right now? How am I connecting to others? How am I serving others? And where is my purpose? What is the gratitude that I have in my life? And, and then going deeper finally to the spirit body and am, am I connected to spirit? Okay. And how can I be more connected if I'm not? So taking this holistic approach, maybe even not thinking about the idea of fertility, but just bringing yourself into alignment, outer and inner alignment. And I find that as one starts to work on that, that fertility blossoms in so many ways. And even if you put in there the cyclical nature again of the woman, a woman to have menstrual cycle awareness and get in tune with her cycle, um, this has a huge impact on fertility. Mm. yoga well, on and off the mat <laughs> this is so a lot to reflect you know for, for me as well oh, what what is your what is your spiritual philosophy that is a good question <laughs> you know what comes to mind when you ask that is embodied consciousness mm. and what does that mean yeah that means where am i right now mm. where am i right now and and who is asking this question and and so where i find myself now besides being in this room and with you mm. and in this body is in this place of embracing all that makes up my present moment. And, and I wanna say this carefully because before my spiritual philosophy was really centered on detachment and, and non-identification and that idea of neti neti, not this, not that, not this, not that. And I started to talk about this earlier in our conversation but I really transitioned to this place of, of yes, I, I am all, I am everything. This is all divine. This yoga studio, the walls in here, the blocks, the floor, the yoga mat, my clothes, my body, the nature outside, this is, this is all divine. It's all part of it. It's all part of my experience. And so this is my philosophy now. It's one of this embodied consciousness of of where am I right now? Okay, what makes up my reality right now? And, and understanding the impermanence, the impermanent nature of what's around, but still seeing it, still appreciating it, still living it, still experiencing it, not trying to dissociate or to turn away or to bypass. So allowing everything to be embodied, to feel my joy fully, to feel my sorrow fully, to feel my anger fully, to, to feel pain fully, to feel ecstasy fully, but to feel it nonetheless, and to also let it go, to love it freely, let it go. The philosophy of just being present, being present with everything that you feel, not pushing it aside, having the strength to feel everything that you need to feel, and then when it's time to let go, you let go. Yes, yes, exactly. And and leaning into whatever I'm mm. feeling. Instead of pushing it away, yeah. which is something that is not easy to do sometimes. It's not yeah. easy. And, and sometimes as spiritual practitioners, I find there's a tendency to push away the shadow mm. and to, or to just 
speak from this place of non-duality when really that's not our earthly experience. And so it can be easy to say, well, that's just an illusion, that's not real. Uh, whatever feelings are there, I'm going to push them away because this isn't really happening and um, it doesn't matter. It's, everything's impermanent. But sometimes I feel like there's something missing there. There's a reason we're in these earthly bodies, that we've incarnated in these bodies to be on this earth. And to me, it's to, to experience what's here, to experience human emotion and to experience life. It's our, it is our mind that will qualify things, that this is good and this is bad. But I wonder if we could drop down to a different layer where we just experience, experience it without label, experience it fully, let it be in our body, embody it, have the courage to lean into whatever is happening and to maybe see it as a message or a guide and to learn from it in some way. Or not, we don't have to have platitudes for everything, but you know, just fully being present, yes, but going even beyond that, not just observing, but experiencing, but able to let go. I love it, I love this. <laughs> oh man okay uh, I there's one more question okay. it's a technical question um, it's about the pelvic floor ah okay why what is it for one uh, to, the, to the uninitiated what is it and why is it important for women specifically and what are some of the techniques involved that we need to engage it, I guess. Okay. Um, well, this is another big mm. question, um, but I can answer it. I'll try to answer briefly. <laughs> we got time. Okay. Pelvic floor, essentially, if the if space you, between your yeah, what your, is. your perineum and your bum. Wait, perineum is bum, right? No. The uh, the, uh, the perineum is the space between your bum and your a your anal <laughs> and your groin or something, right? Sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're gonna have to use some words here yeah. to get comfortable. <laughs> we're just gonna throw them all out there. We're gonna say vagina and anus and penis. We just get it all out there now. Mm -hmm. So we are talking about the underside of your body. So the pelvic floor is this uh, group of muscles basically that runs from the pubic bone, okay, on the front of your pelvis, the pubic bone. Yeah, right. Here. Okay. Yeah, the pubic bone under the pelvis to the two sitting bones, which you're probably mm. sitting on, Your bum. and then to the tailbone. Okay. Okay. So it's this sheet of muscles. It's often described as a hammock, but um, I'm not so keen on that description because a hammock sounds like it's just hanging there, you know? But actually this is a sheet of muscles that is toned, and it's more like a trampoline because mm. it's able to... Um, resist and... Yeah, resist and release as well. Okay, so it's this hammock of muscles under the, the underside of the pelvis that has tremendous function. And we could think about one function, there's three layers to the pelvic floor, and the superficial layer is the layer that you could actually palpate and touch if you were to reach your hand down between your legs and start to palpate okay. around your genitals. So for, for women, this layer is hugging around three openings, around the urethra, the vagina, the anus. Oh boy, okay. yeah, go on. Here we go, we're diving deep into all this. <laughs> Strap in, seatbelts. <laughs> and for men, it's basically just around two openings. Okay. The bum and the... Yeah, where your pee comes oh, okay. out. And so, so this is a superficial side that you can actually palpate. And this is going to help control um, your pee to let it out or right. to not, to yeah. let out your gas, to let out your poo. Okay? It also gives you sexual appreciation as well. Okay. And then you have um, another layer that is, has more the involuntary, um, more, I would say the voluntary control of pee and poo that's hard to detect. And then you have a deeper layer, and that's on... If, you had a pel if we had a pelvis here and we could look from the inside of the pelvis to the base of the pelvis, mm. we would see this deep inner layer. And this, this has more things like the levitar ani in it, which just for um, a fact that is the anus lifter, if you like to know, okay. in Latin. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so this, um, these muscles of the pelvic floor, not only do they help control elimination and give you sexual appreciation, but also they're supporting all of your internal organs, basically. Mm. Everything that's above it. And they're helping to control and distribute the intra-abdominal pressure that builds up when you breathe. Because if you take a breath now, a really full 
diaphragmatic breath. What happens to your belly when you inhale? Expands. Yeah. And what happens when you exhale? Contracts. Yes. And so when the belly expands, why do you think it does that when you breathe? Air goes in, belly fills. But where does the air go? Lungs. Yes. Mm. So why does the belly the, pop out? The, the hammock expands. You're close. One hammock above it does. Uh, the diaphragm. The diaphragm, yeah. yeah. So when you take the breath in, the diaphragm that's connected under the rib cage is Pressing going down. to press down. It spreads, gets bigger as the rib cage expands and it presses down. And that pushes all your abdominal organs out. So the belly will expand. Okay? And as you exhale, the diaphragm lifts back into place and it draws the belly with it. So what do you think receives that breath? Mm. That would be the pelvic floor. Because where's all that pressure going to go? You've just expanded the belly out. So what is going to receive all that? It's the pelvic floor. So the pelvic floor also kind of descends and spreads, releases. So it's like the hammock dropping down. You can visualize it that way. So it's going to receive all of that intra-abdominal pressure. And so that's really important because it's helping to maintain the right pressure basically in our core. And, and then the pelvic floor has many other functions as well. Um, essentially, we can't live without the pelvic floor. Cool. Okay. And so for men and women, it's really important for vitality, for obviously if you're thinking about your elimination and your sexual function, it's essential. Okay? Um, and then for women, it has a few more functions, and that is with the birth of the baby. Contrary to what many people think, they think, oh, the pelvic floor should be totally soft and relaxed so that baby can just birth out. But actually, the pelvic floor is this group of muscles, right? So it needs to be toned. It has to have, well, it has to have some resistance and it has to be able to soften and release. And the resistance it needs is for a baby's head so that baby's head can navigate the pelvis. But then it has to be able to soften and release so that baby can birth and, and to be able to come out. So you need both. And um, now I even forgot what your original question was. Why is it so important yeah, for yeah. women? Yeah. Um, so obviously it assists through childbirth and then in postpartum it's um, an area that we really focus on to make sure that the pelvic floor is balanced so that all these functions are um, working optimally in the woman. Does birth cause the pelvic floor to, to compromise in any way? It can and it depends on what type of birth a woman has. So. <clears throat> a woman who has a vaginal birth, if it's assisted with like forceps or vacuum, then that has a vacuum. higher. Yeah, <laughs> that's quite common in Singapore okay. actually, um, to help bring the yeah, baby yeah. out. So if she has, that's called an assisted delivery, and yes, that can have a higher risk of pelvic floor damage sometimes um, or injury. And then even for a woman who has a C section who doesn't birth baby through the vaginal canal, she also can have pelvic floor issues just because of the weight of carrying baby. Um, but what's interesting is that it's not always a weak pelvic floor. Some women can have an over recruited pelvic floor and that's where you're holding a lot of tension. And that could be from a traumatic birth experience or just trauma in general um, and not related to birth and pregnancy actually there's a stat that's about 40% of yoga practitioners have an over-recruited pelvic floor because doing practice, too many yeah. mula bandhas. Yes, uh, yeah, too much of squeezing, yeah. basically. Um, yeah, so also for women, the reason that I focus so much on pelvic floor health is because it's not only is it an essential part of a functional birth experience, physiological birth, and also recovery postpartum, but it has a huge impact on hormonal health and for the way that a woman experiences her menstrual cycle, perimenopause, and menopause, is to be able to work with the pelvic floor. And I would say for men, it's just as important, but that's not my area, so I don't, I don't know too much about men's health, so. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. How, how does the, how, what do you need to do to train it or to, if it's too tight, how do you loosen it? If it's too soft, yeah. how do you engage it? What's the... <laughs> yeah, so a little terminology, you can have 
within those group of muscles of the pelvic floor, you can have a hypotonic pelvic floor, which means that the muscles are a little bit um, loose, they're having trouble to engage. You can have a hypertonic, so the muscles are over-recruited. You can also have a combination where you have some hypertonic and some hypotonic. And there's different ways to get an idea of what's happening with your pelvic floor by the symptoms that you have. Um, you want me to go into this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so for someone who, if, if in this I can relate more towards women, but I think men could find their own relationship to this as well. But for women, if they are having stress incontinence, like where they laugh, sneeze, cough, jump on a trampoline, and a little bit of pee comes out, um, that's called stress incontinence. So if that's happening, Stressed incontinence. incontinence okay. If that's happening, or if tampons or moon cups are having difficulty mm-hmm. to stay in place, right? Um, if any women are having like these vaginal farts that can happen sometimes in yoga classes, and this oh. is for yoga teachers. Yoga teachers should be aware of this because I'm sure that they're hearing this happen in the class sometimes. Okay. Um, that's when wind escapes from right. the, the vagina, right? And then. Um, yeah, so this would be kind of some of the main, or if there's a feeling of bulging down or bearing down, something falling out of, of you as a woman. So those are symptoms that can relate to a loose pelvic floor or hypotonic. And hypertonic, when it's over-recruited, um, one indication sometimes can be jaw pain and grinding teeth and clenching yeah. the jaw because the jaw and the pelvis are very oh, much connected. Wow but also pain on intercourse or for a woman inserting anything into the vagina, tampon, even any kind of pain. Urge incontinence, that's where there's a feeling of urgency to have to get to the toilet. Like suddenly I really gotta go and no one better be in my way, you know, and I really need to get there. So those are kind of, um, and even palpating around the sitting bones, if it's really tender or tight, that can indicate um, over-recruited pelvic floor. So those are some ways you can sort of assess on your own. I always recommend for the women that I work with, whether they are um, not pregnant, pregnant or postpartum, to, if they can, go have an assessment with a pelvic health physiotherapist because we have some really excellent ones in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And they're able to give biofeedback using ultrasound to see how are you engaging your pelvic floor and what is the status of your pelvic floor. So it gives you amazing information. Um, And so those are some ways you can get an idea. And and now I want to go to the first part of your question. Okay, what do you do with this, right? So, So the pelvic floor actually can balance itself the best through your posture and your breath. And that's always the starting place for me when I'm working with people, is to look at the posture. Do you have a neutral pelvis? And is your rib cage stacked neutrally over your pelvis? Okay, we want to have this nice alignment so that when we breathe, the diaphragm can descend, the ribs expand, the air comes in, our belly pushes out slightly, the pelvic floor can receive all of that. And when you exhale, through the movement of the diaphragm, everything's returning back to neutral. So you have this natural lift and release of the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. So if you have amazing posture and a good full diaphragmatic breath, that's 21,000 times a day, you could be balancing your pelvic floor naturally. You don't have to have any intentional exercise in there. Um, That's the first way. Second way is what I like to do with the women in particular that I work with is just to help them connect to their pelvic floor because a lot of us have no idea how to feel it. You know, where is it? How do you feel it? We hear about mula bandha and asana classes. Yeah, Yeah, so abstract. And the way that you practice mula bandha is very different from how we practice um, pelvic floor from a physiological point of view. It's quite different because mula bandha is energetic. And so, um, yeah, I like to help women be able to connect to how to find their pelvic floor. So there's different exercises that we work on together to feel the superficial muscles and to feel the deeper muscles. And then I help them start to coordinate it to their breath as well. Um, Sometimes it's a really big learning curve because if, especially if someone's been practicing yoga for a while, they tend to um, have a reverse relationship with their pelvic floor. So... Sometimes there's a lot of undoing, um, but with practice, just like anything, you can yeah. start to create new connections with your body. 
Okay. And it can be really simple. And actually, I have a lot of this on my YouTube channel, like really Ooh. short videos. So if anyone's <laughs> interested, feel free to plug that in. Can take a look there. Yes, if you if if people are looking to find out more about pelvic floor techniques and exercises, mm-hmm. they can find your YouTube channel, which is called Yes. At the moment, because I don't have a hundred subscribers, so please everyone subscribe. <laughs> um, it's called A A Sawyer One. Okay. I can't uh, give it a nice name until I get more subscribers. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, one of those. <laughs> uh, I'll link it in the description okay. below as well. Right. And you also have a few. I guess we can close it off. Yeah. Um, how can people reach you on your social media? If you have a website yeah or... i do all of this is um, sort of new because it was during covid where i actually give time to put stuff out there so um, i have my website that's ambersawyer.com and i have um, a facebook page a newer one that i'm trying to promote now it's at embodied woman yoga and then on instagram i have at embodied.woman.yoga um, and then the YouTube is right. AA Sawyer one. And you have your yoga, your embodied women prenatal and postpartum teacher training as well available. Yes, yeah. So that um, that's like a every two. It's twice, twice a, a year. year. Yeah, biannually. We just finished our um, around the right, st- yeah. end of July. It's fantastic. And the next one is in November this year, twenty third November. Okay, if anybody wants to to take part in that. Again, all of the stuff will be, I'll put it in the description below. Thank you, Aaron. I think that's it, Amber. Thank you for coming down and sharing all the information, all the knowledge that you have. I am, I feel like I, 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 I'm just sitting here and I'm listening. I'm, I, I didn't, I, I tried my best to, to, to take part in it as much as I can through my own natural inquiry. But how, after what, whatever you say, I'll just be, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got I've not, I got nothing else to add on next next question, but it's so interesting. I really feel like I've learned a lot, and I'm. I hope that people who listen to this will get the chance to learn as well. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed doing this, and and the <clears throat> listeners couldn't see, but I enjoyed watching your expressions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, oh my, That's you're talking. my cringiness and all. When we talk about like all this kind of stuff, it's yeah. Like I said, as a guy, it's it's sometimes it's just hard to listen to. And you don't have the opportunity to sit with like someone like you who can really share all these things in a very um, personal and scientific way at the same time, and 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 for us to understand it as as men, because it is it's a weird thing, but 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 it is very enlightening. Oh. So I'm glad that you shared it with Thank me. Thank you. Maybe we need to have a workshop for men sometime on these topics. Hey, yeah, <laughs> put that out there. <laughs> well, thanks so much for your time. I really enjoyed it and I want to say thank you to all the listeners the people that choose to tune in um, as well so thank you all thank you as well and with that (sighs) so that's it that's the end of the podcast Uh, I hope you found it as informative as I did Uh, I'm just I just I feel so lucky to be in this position where I'm like I'm like able to speak to all these wonderful knowledgeable people and and I've learned a lot and I hope you have too. Um I feel really grateful so so thank you Amber for for being a guest. Thank you to all my guests. Past, future guests, present guests. Thank you all. I hope if you're a woman listening, it it, ga- it gave you a little more uh understanding into what it meant or what it means to be a woman and uh and if you're a man, I hope that it gave you some insight into what what women go through and and how you can sort of be there for them, I guess. Uh, if you like what you hear, as always, share it with your friends, repost it on IG stories and tag me, then I will receive it and I'll repost it. Um, you can also support the podcast by donating, links in the description. And if you're interested to learn more about prenatal, postnatal, postnatal postpartum yoga stuff uh, you can check out Amber's upcoming workshops and events all in the links below as well uh, yeah okay that's it that, uh, it's been great I really enjoyed this conversation I, I hope you did too 
Thanks for listening and have a great day, morning, evening, wherever you are, what time you're listening to. Okay. Okay, bye.